It's time to play division football on the road. And, yes, there will be thousands and thousands of Chiefs fans at SoFi as the Chiefs take on the Chargers in Los Angeles. A lot of those fans are there because of Ticketmaster, which brings you Defending the Kingdom. But on this Defending the Kingdom, DTK is talking about DBD, Demand Better Defense. They give it up. Bashan Robinson hit in the backfield. He goes down. Kansas City holds on downs again. Nick Bolton. Hi, everyone. I'm Mitch Holtis, voice of the Chiefs, along with senior team reporter Matt McMullen as the Chiefs win with a goal line stand twice against the Atlanta Falcons. But it leads us into this first division game and a chance for this demand better defense to play against the Chargers. What a game on Sunday. Oof. Once again, it comes down to the very end. Big win for the Chiefs. I know when the schedule first came out, you look at it, Ravens, Bengals, and then I don't want to call it a trap game, but it's tough when you have your first game immediately after that stretch, and it's an NFC opponent. You're on the road. It's Sunday night football, and that place was electric. It was a big, big deal for that building to have that game on that night. You mentioned the home of the Chiefs, though. It was a pretty loud home of the Chiefs at the end of the anthem, wasn't it? You and I sat there. Uh, Matt spots for me on the road, just so you know. And he's fantastic at doing this job. But we always hear at the end of the national anthem, you can always tell how many Chiefs fans are there by the roar of the Chiefs at the end of the anthem. There will be another one at SoFi. And I'll have to, full disclosure, I'm going to deal with SoFi here. i got to get psyched up because Radio Rick is there. Uh huh. You know Radio Rick? Oh, yeah. All right. So... <laughs> Where are the Charger fans? I'm not sure. Um, most of them are in San Diego. They left them there. But Radio Rick, the, the, last year the Chiefs come onto the field. I hear this boo, boo. I go, well, who's booing? Because three-fourths of the fans here are Chiefs. And I look over at Radio Rick, and he's got the fader on his like We're at the wedding dance. And he's the DJ at the wedding dance. So not saying there's some manufactured sound at SoFi, but there might be. All right. Before we jump into the DBD, let's take a look at our trip around the world. What do we have? I have eight today. Eight. And it's our first division game. How about eight for eight straight division titles going for nine? How's that sound? Mm, I like it. See what you're doing there. So this first one is fun. So my wife, Ellie, tries to introduce me to things other than sports every once in a while. Wonderful woman. She's a huge sports fan, but she reminds me there are other things. I didn't know that. Like possum in the backyard that she has to deal with when you're going? So when we were in the radio booth for the Falcons game, <laughs> coming down to the wire, she sends me a text. There is a possum right outside. My dog is losing her mind. It's a lucky possum. Maybe the possum will be back on, on Sunday. I don't know. She'll let me know. She'll let us know. But she reminds me there are things other than sports in the world. One of those things is at the Nelson Art Gallery. There was a, a, an exhibit, the Hakusai artist. Have you seen the old uh, classic painting is he of a free agent? the wave? I I don't think so. No, okay. signed by the Nelson. There's the old classic painting of the wave and Mount Fuji's in the background. You'd recognize it if you saw it. Okay. I'll be honest. I didn't know it when she first told me about it. Then she showed me the picture, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, that was at the Nelson. It's pretty cool. It's like 300 years old. Anyway, long story short, we went to that on Friday night before we left for Atlanta, and I ran into Sharon and David there. They said hi, big cheese fans. And get this, so their oldest son uh, played football at Missouri S&T with Tershawn Wharton. And Sharon said that, exactly, go Miners. Sharon said that uh, she was second to only Turk's mom in terms of noise production. Wow. Yeah. So shout out to you both. It was awesome meeting you both. And yeah, I, I went to an art gallery. How about that? I'm impressed. I know, I know. I was doing paint by color, if that was okay. <laughs> same, uh, same thing. By, by paint by number, yeah. <laughs> uh, is green three or four? <laughs> I don't know. It's funny because paint by number is supposed to be like idiot proof. And yeah. then Ellie and I, we did that years ago. And mine just looks terrible. Well, mine was a ducky and a horsey, and it was only ch <laughs> there was just four, and I tried to. I think I chose the wrong color. But. Well, I believe in you. Uh, I also heard appreciate from your culture, though. It's really good. <laughs> a listener in Sacramento, uh, they wear their chief gear proudly. Uh, even their horse is from the Ozarks, and whenever they go out on rides, they listen to DTK. Second group we've had from Sacramento. Remember the group I yep. met? And hey, they're getting the A's. They're like, nah, we don't care. But so love it, man. We're a Sacramento's a hotbed. Comes in clusters. Love it. Uh, heard from a listener in Branson. Speaking of hotbeds, uh, home of the Pirates. This listener uh, has lived in Southwest Missouri his whole life and repped the kingdom down there. And invited us both down for uh, a round of beers in Branson. We ever want to go? I'm in. Yep. Uh, shout out to Carl. Uh, been a Chiefs fan for 54 years and counting. Shout out to you, Carl. We got a listener in Switzerland. 
Uh, they came to Kansas City for a Chiefs Broncos game last year. Pretty cool. Uh, Daniel is in Seymour, Missouri. You've been to Seymour, right? Oh, I don't think so. Oh, okay. I've been to Seymour. We'll have to go. Hmm. Eric is in Hickory. After we go to Branson. After we go to Branson. For the beer. Tour of Missouri. Uh, Eric is in Hickory, North Carolina. Ever been there? I have been to Hickory, North Carolina. That's (laughs) the hometown of Ryan Suckup. Really? Yep. Okay. He's from Hickory, North Carolina. And Coach Barnes, uh, basketball coach Rick Barnes, is from Hickory, North Carolina. Okay. The more you know. Yep. Ryan Suckup went to South Carolina after growing up in North Carolina. Yeah, but it's all kind of together. Yeah, all yeah. Carolina. We'll be there later this Pretty year. Pretty close. I mean, you go to it, South Charlotte is really the, it, so it's North Carolina, but South Charlotte's the sort of South Carolina border. Right? Okay. Rock Hill's right there. Yeah. I've only been to it's the kind Charlotte of the Kansas Missouri thing. Yeah. Got it. That's yeah. why it's the Carolina Panthers. I yeah, guess. That exactly. Makes sense. Okay. Which okay. their training camp for many years was in Spartanburg, South Carolina, right, home of Wofford College. Okay. The Terriers. I learned things on DTK, <laughs> things I didn't know, geographical things. Well, you're giving me my cultural. I didn't know about the Hokusai. Hokusai. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a thing. I thought he was a linebacker <laughs> with the <laughs> Dolphins. Lastly, uh, shout out to the cashier at High V that uh, was very friendly to my wife the other day when we were in Atlanta <laughs> hanging out, uh, and uh, she was grocery shopping, taking care of me as she does, and we share obviously a fuel saver card, <laughs> and he saw it, and he was like. Matt with the Chiefs, and she was, he was to very your nice. Wife. Yes, <laughs> to Ellie, and he like, was very nice. What are you doing with Matt McMullen's <laughs> field saver card? <laughs> he was very nice, and uh, they talked about football, and it was great. So anyway, shout out to you. She but did not wa- get his name though. I asked, "What's his name?" She's like, "Oh, I didn't ask." Like you gotta ask his name. I'll give you his name because the very next day, <laughs> yeah. All right, the world headquarters of Odyssey, which is uh, in Kansas City, which is the flag home of the flagship station. Uh, 96.5, the fan of the largest network in the National Football League, the Chiefs Radio Network. Well, I'm there on Mondays uh, because we're preparing to do the Chiefs Kingdom show on Monday night. But I'm hungry, so I go over to High V. I'm going to get a sandwich and go back. And who do I meet but the guy that goes, he comes up to me and he goes, Matt McMullen's wife was in here with (laughs) with his fuel saver card. (laughs) Bobby. Bobby. Okay, Bobby. There we go. Yep, shout out to Bobby. He's a big DTK head, I guess. Shout out to you, Bobby. Thanks for being nice to all of us. (laughs) Shout out to Bobby, huge Chase fan and... And Ellie, who's yeah. dealing with the fame of Matt McMullen, right? <laughs> well, do you know what's hey, funny say too? hi to Matt. Well, so uh, apparently he asked her, have you met Patrick <laughs> Mahomes? And she said at first, no, because I have never introduced Ellie to Patrick Mahomes. But then she remembered. So Ellie works for the Kansas City Zoo and Aquarium. And she remembered, actually, I've given Patrick tours of the zoo before. So she has met him independently of me. So then they talked about that for a while. So, yeah, just a day at the grocery store. So she has a one-up on you. Oh, yeah, she does. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. So shout out to Bobby and everybody else who's in love with Matt McMullen, including me. All right. <laughs> okay. uh, let's talk about the d D. That is demand better defense. Last year, the Chiefs defense was remarkable. In many ways, you can say that's why the Chiefs won Super Bowl 58, especially in the March uh, to make it there the toughest path to ever win a Super Bowl by any team uh, since the Super Bowl began in 1966. The defense, though, was remarkable, but... This year, Steve Spagnuolo had a D-bet theme, meaning demand better from this defense. Now, statistically, right now, they're not like last year's defense, which was second in the scoring defense in the NFL. But this is a team now that remarkably has not given up over 28 points in a game for 24 straight games. That's the fourth best since 2000. Fool's gold. There's a lot of fool's gold in stats in the NFL. Yes. One of those is 300-yard passing games. For sure, 350-yard passing games. Just look at, look at the one-loss record in those games. Sometimes 100-yard receiving games are that way. Oh, it's great for fantasy, but not necessarily for uh, reality. On the defensive side, total defensive numbers is fool's gold. So you look at the Chiefs right now in total defense, they're near the bottom of the league. Okay. You have to look at scoring defense. When teams get close to the goal line, what happens? Atlanta, very good in red zone defense. That's why the Chiefs struggle when they got there. Let's give the Chargers credit. They've been really good in red zone defense, but so have the Chiefs. Think about this, and we're going to have Nick Bolton on later. He's the leader of the DBD cause. Uh, But the fact that they're so good when teams get near the goal line, it's when this Chiefs defense shows its best work. It says so much about the character of this team. If the Chiefs had not won back-to-back Super Bowls, if they didn't have all this playoff experience, who knows what happens in Atlanta on Sunday night. But we saw a team that has been there and done that and knows that they can defend every blade of grass 
and it doesn't matter if the momentum is coming up against them, they still have an opportunity to get a stop if the team hasn't scored yet. I think it's so cool that Atlanta really didn't earn their way down the field on that very last drive. They, there's three penalties that just moved the ball right down the field. They're down five points. It's at the 13-yard line, and it's third and one. Well, the Chiefs defense, it would be very easy to say, ah, they're going to pick this up. They're going to pick it up. Let's just turn the page to the next set of downs. Well, they didn't do that. They stuffed the run. Well, now it's fourth and one. Same mindset. These are the Atlanta Falcons. They have B. John Robinson in the backfield. They have Tyler Algier, maybe the best backup running back in the NFL. They're going to get the inches they need to get a fresh set of downs, and there's less than a minute left on the clock. This is a moment where most defenses would be panicking, and the Chiefs defense didn't panic. And that's pretty cool that with everything that had happened, all the momentum the Falcons had, their place is going crazy, they're so excited, they can maybe knock off the Chiefs on Sunday night football in their house. And Nick Bolton says, no, we're going to end it right here, and the Chiefs are going to win this game. Just says a lot about the character of this defense. And we love stats. It's fun to use stats to put things into context, but you can't quite statistically quantify that. The Chiefs just have it defensively right now. We've seen it over the last couple years, and we definitely saw it on Sunday night. Don't really think about a defense based on total defense, and that's really a flaw by a lot of fans and, let's be honest, a lot of the media that cover the NFL. Like, ooh, that's not a very good defense. It's all about scoring defense, and in just a few moments, we're going to hear from Nick Bolton. And in fact, he said something. We're, we're featuring Nick this week on a lot of our social platforms. You can find him. But he had some really good things to say. Uh, two things that come to mind. One, this defense, that it matters so much to them. And we are thinking, well, doesn't that for every – no, nope, nope. This is a team, uh, a defense that loves to play football, and it matters so much. The second point that is brought up is we have this young experience. Now, Nick's the leader of this defense. He wears the green dot. He makes the defensive calls. We're going to talk about the, all that's on his plate here in a, just a, a bit. But if you look at the 22 draft class that I talk about all the time, their mental and emotional maturity goes back to, as teams get closer to the goal line, their resolve goes up. It's not just words, it's reality. But you have to be emotionally and mentally tough as well as physically tough to handle that. The fact that that class, the class of 2022 defensive players, are 43-0 and in the playoffs tells you, when, when, and when Nick said it, Young experience comes into play here. We have seen it now the first three weeks of the season from that group in specific of the DBD. And looking at everything you just said, the two different sides of it, the young players and also how much they all care as a unit, I'll put them both together because it reminds me of what Trent McDuffie was saying after Super Bowl 57. The Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. Trent McDuffie is a rookie and is a Super Bowl champion. But all offseason, whenever we'd ask him about it, he was like, yeah, it's awesome, but he was – like generally irritated that they allowed 35 points <laughs> defensively. <laughs> like he was like, yeah, we won, but we didn't play to our caliber. We're a lot better than that. We didn't feel good about our performance out there. We put our offense in bad positions. That says everything you need to know about these young defenders that they're Super Bowl champions and they are looking back at it like, yeah, but we could have won 38 to 10, 38 to 15, 14, whatever. We didn't need to allow all those points. And I think it's so cool that then the defense was significantly better the following season, and the defense was a major reason why the Chiefs won the Super Bowl this past year. So these guys do care a lot, and it gets back to debet, demand better. They really don't get wrapped up in the numbers or the success. It's all about how can we continue this? How can we be even better than we were before? And that mindset – you can't pay for that. I mean, a lot of players just don't have that. We're so fortunate that we have a combination of uh, players that have been around a little bit, like Nick Bolton, kind of funny calling him a veteran now. still feel like it was draft night back in uh, 2021. But you have a veteran like Nick Bolton, veteran like Justin Reed, uh, these guys that have been around, but also young players going into just their third year in the NFL who continue to ascend. It's just very exciting stuff. You saw it at Missouri. The Frisco Lone Star Ranger from Frisco, Texas. The leader of the DBD defense, Nick Bolton. Oh, let's just bring in the hero of the win over the Atlanta Falcons, Nick Bolton, number 32. Now, Nick, you know this. I love high school football at all levels, but I love Texas high school football. For a Frisco Lone Star Ranger to tackle a dude from UT, he doesn't even count. He went to like Tucson, Arizona, yeah. but to 
get that play. How cool was it? Yeah, man, it was a definitely a special uh, a moment for our team. Uh, kind of when dinged up throughout the game, man, and just kind of sticking to it. Um, just finding a way to uh, help my teammates, help my brothers win the football game. And um, I give credit to a lot of those guys that uh, held down the fort for us. Um, Drew made a great play, kind of gave us a chance to give him a third and short, uh, and get it to fourth down, and then ultimately made a play on fourth. What about recognition there? I wish in the play-by-play, I did not mention Algier was out there together with him. Mm -hmm. How much of that was maybe a tip-off for you or your recognition of thinking what they might run? Yeah, man, I think uh, when I first lined up, I saw both the backs. Uh, 25 is a bigger back, so first thing I think is maybe fullback dive. Um, then he checked and went to alert, and I saw seven back there. So seven's a speed guy, um, perimeter guy. Um, so uh, after alert came up, I kind of figured that uh, it was probably going to be a perimeter run. I just waited for 25 to kind of lead me to the ball, man, just shot my gap. You have had to fight through. Coach talks at power throwing these injuries. You get hurt in that game. I'm, we're sitting there watching you trying to get back. How much have you had to fight through this season injury-wise, and how much did you have to fight through in the Atlanta game? Yeah, man, I think uh, the last couple of years, man, it's kind of just been that been that story. I just got to figure out a way to uh, – Shopping my best foot forward, and I'm um, trying to get me plays I can in for our team, and uh, ultimately uh, can help us win. And so, uh, just fighting through injuries, man, it's kind of just been the story the last two years. But got to find the beauty in the struggle a little bit. I want to ask you about the mindset of this defensive team of the Chiefs? Yeah. O and two were the Ravens in goal to go. You defend, put up a brick wall at the six and the eleven to win the game. What about the mindset of this team, particularly as teams get close to the goal? Yeah, man, I think uh, you kind of hit on it. It's demanding better. Uh, from where we were last year, we got a lot of praise on what we were able to do during the season. And um, one of the things we wanted to demand better on was, was run defense. I think we were like 27th in the league. And so uh, I think we kind of feel that in the first couple of games, man. Kind of demand everybody to kind of do their part, uh, do your 111th. Um, and, and ultimately comes down to, to making game time plays at the end of the game. And um, uh, everybody saw the last play of the game where I made the play, but the play was made through the people we put in on the D-line, uh, getting vertical, Leo's crushing the tackle put them in the backfield, and I just go there and execute the play. So I think it takes all 11. Uh, everybody's demanding better of each other and of your teammates and, the, and your coaches as well. Uh, we just kind of take the next step forward. And for you to lead the whole group, you wear the green dot. I try to remind fans all the time, mm -hmm. you're the quarterback of the defense. Uh, in trying to orchestrate all that D-bet defense, um, tell me what's on your plate because it seems like you got a full plate. Yeah, man, I'm just trying to uh, – the best I can in the fastest way possible I can, I'm trying to get, uh, get everybody aligned. I make sure there's no uh, mislap in communication. Uh, if I can try to help somebody out with a key or two before a snap, uh, what I saw throughout the week, I try to get that out to them as quick as I can as well. And then ultimately, I just try to let guys play fast. If in any way I can minimize communication or make things um, concise so guys can go line up and play the quickest, man, I try to do that the best way possible. And at the end of the day, uh, I'm just trying to get my love and play better than yours. And how big is it that you – we, we rotate so many guys on the defensive front. Turk's playing great. Felix makes a play in that game. Those guys keeping dudes off of you guys at the second level. How big is that? Yeah, man, it's huge. Uh, I think all, all game, man, we kind of moved around, got in some bare front. Uh, there was an open team last game, so taking that away from them, putting the body there, uh, playing a little bit in the bare front, man, and they're, they're keeping me clean, uh, letting me scrape over the top and kind of use what, what God gave me, man, my eyes, hands, and feet, and um, go out there and make plays. And so uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier, man, it's been taking everybody. Uh, Turk's been crushing people. Chris is doing his thing. Mike Pinnell goes there and do his thing. Uh, you got Drew and Leo on the edges, man, uh, setting the edge. And then Jamari comes down there and makes plays, too. So uh, all those guys, man, are integral pieces to me to be able to do my job. The whole d thing is really working. Coverage for you guys at linebacker, whether it's you, Drew, Leo, whomever's out there, coverage. And, and the first two weeks of seeing all those tight ends on the field, and I'm looking at the Chargers going, we could see two or three tight ends in this game. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, I think uh, we do a great job, man, trying to, trying to keep guys from doing what they do well. Uh, a lot of times, uh, guys want to get their wideouts going, um, so it kind of leaves a little looky yardage into the tight ends, man. But some of that stuff, when you go into the game plan throughout the week, you got to live with it. Um, and so if you want to take away the best wideouts, man, you're not going to be able to take away everybody's best everything. So you kind of got to live with some of those things, and now you got to tackle it and try to keep everything in front the best we can. You've taken so much pride in stopping the run, but the biggest thing the Chargers are doing now is J.K. Dobbins. Yep. He's third in the league in rushing. He's had big plays. How do you slow him down? And how do you prevent the splash big play? Because it looks like the Chargers can do that in their offense with him. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely from uh, what I've seen on tape, man, uh, J.K.'s been electric with the football in his hands. And they, they're doing a great job of switching up different runs and like not having an ID on exactly like they're going to run this play. They highly hit everything about one, two times, and I'm trying to trust your keys. And uh, it's going to take all 11 of us. Uh, since training camp, we've been priding ourselves on eyes and, and discipline and knowing our scheme and knowing where the guy's going to be aligned at. And I think it's going to be uh, probably biggest in this stage in this game. 
because um, they're going to play a whole bunch of different run games, a whole bunch of different gap schemes, uh, try to get your eyes and jet motion and, and everybody get discombobulated. And so that's going to take a lot of communication to eyes and just getting guys aligned up and just touching your keys and playing fast. Ice in his veins to make the stop to win the game, but how nervous were you when Missouri's in overtime with Vanderbilt? Oh, yeah, man. Uh, it was a tough one, man. I, ha I had to cut it off for a little bit, man. And, uh, we got a lot of good thing is we got a lot of Mizzou guys uh, dropped the facility, man. So they're able to keep me updated on the score. Uh, we got to find a way to win, though, and uh, we got a good one this week, too. He is the leader of the whole D bet charge. We're in the green dot and making plays. 32, Nick Bolton. Great stuff from Nick Bolton, man. What a leader. There's so much on that dude's plate. And uh, you kind of went through it and, and particularly getting ready for this Charger game. Before we do that, though, he mentioned something, and, and I asked him about it. But our defensive rotation up front to take the heat off linebackers, when you look at how many guys we're playing that are all playing at high levels, I mean, Mike Pinnell gets a sack, uh, his third in his 10 years, and he does it on his back. He's like a turtle, right? <laughs> in the middle, of, you, you pick up the turtle, it's on his back, and he still makes a, a, a hit there. Uh, Felix and Yudike Uzama gets a, a sack and a strip on the play. Turk Wharton's playing out of his mind. We know about Chris uh, Jones. Mike Dana continues to make plays. And George Karloftis. But the fact that you can rotate guys and you never fall off and Nick said that's such a big part of this defense and keeping heat off the linebackers. It's a major luxury to have. And these guys have been around and they know each other. We brought back virtually the entire defensive line from last year. They can play off of each other. It's really the ultimate team game when you're in the trenches like that. And they know what the other is thinking, what they're going to do. If they're in for a player, hey, what do I need to make sure I do on this rep? It's just a, a major luxury to have. I'm glad you mentioned Turk Wharton, and we mentioned him earlier as well. He's the reason Shamari Connor had an opportunity for that interception, because he blew up Kirk Cousins uh, on that play. Turk's having a great year. Those interior guys don't always get a lot of credit if they're not getting sacks or, or things like that. But again, we talk about how we love stats. Stats don't always quantify how those defensive players are, are making a real impact and changing everything else. And how about Leo Chanel, who occupied the space and, and blew up the offensive linemen so that Nick could could destroy <laughs> Bijan Robinson on that stretch play on fourth down. It all works together in concert. It's not just one player. We're very fortunate to have a bunch of players who all work so well together on this defense. Two guys that are on a meteoric rise. Our guest last week, Chamari Connor and Leo Chanel. He's done it three weeks in a row now. And the video does not lie. When you go back and watch the game, and especially that last play where he blows up Matthews to allow uh, Nick to make the play he made, you see the value of Leo Chanel. Now let's jump into the Chargers here. It's very clear to me what Jim Harbaugh is trying to do. He, it is about mindset with the Chargers. It's about setting a identity and a culture with the Chargers, and that is – now he's very different than his brother. Okay, if everybody goes, hey, it's John and Jim, Jim and John. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Two brothers, uh, biological brothers, but very different. But one thing Jim is, to me, is very clear of what he's trying to do is bring the Baltimore Ravens identity to the AFC West. This is a team that is uh, stressing physical, fist fight football. They had that game against the Steelers. Just look at the injury report, not just for the Chargers, look at it for the Steelers. That was the Battle of Falkirk uh, in the movie Braveheart. That's what that game was, and that's the way the Chargers are wanting to play. Now, on the offensive side of the ball, it's really interesting. The offensive numbers are not very good for the Chargers in some areas. Uh, they cannot stay on the field. They have 11 three and outs and 35 possessions now, near the bottom of the league. Uh, that's 29th, in fact, in the league. Only 320-plus plays. But what they do have is J.K. Dobbins. And so they're trying to get explosive plays from their run game. So this DBD defense, your thoughts uh, on defending not just the run game, but what J.K. Got Dobbins can do. Third in the league in rushing, including a 61-yard run. They're getting chunk plays and explosive plays in the Charger run game. I'm glad you mentioned how they're emulating the Baltimore Ravens because their offensive coordinator is Greg Roman, who was the Ravens' offensive coordinator for years with Lamar Jackson. He was also the offensive coordinator in San Francisco with Colin Kaepernick. Loves to run the football, and he's bringing that identity to the Ravens. J.K. Dobbins, of course, was one of his running backs in Baltimore for years. And look at these numbers. Really interesting. When you have Justin Herbert, you think you'd be throwing the football a lot, but they're not. They're only throwing the football 45% of the time. That is the fourth lowest rate of any team in the NFL. They have only three passes of 20 or more yards. Only New England has fewer. 
They're running the ball, though, a ton. They're running the ball on first down 67% of the time. Only Green Bay and Pittsburgh do so at a higher rate. And you're right, Dobbins is the guy. Gus Edwards, ironically, another former Raven, is also there. He gets carries, but Dobbins is the player that's really been their bell cow. He's third among all players in rushing yards right now with 310. He's averaging 7.4 yards per carry. He's been very productive. 19% of his carries have picked up double-digit yardage. Now, the Steelers did an awesome job at slowing him down, and that's the key for the Chiefs here in this game. The first two weeks for J.K. Dobbins, he had 130 rushing yards in both games. He had multiple runs of 10 or more yards in both games and at least four broken tackles in both games. Well, against the Steelers, he gained just 44 rushing yards on 15 attempts. He had an average of 2.9 yards per carry, just one broken tackle. You have to make them one-dimensional. If you make them one-dimensional, no matter who is at quarterback, we're shooting this on Tuesday, we don't know who's going to be at quarterback on Sunday for the Chargers, but no no matter who's back there, if you make them one-dimensional, stop that running game, the offense with Greg Roman does not work nearly as well. And we saw it last week against the Steelers. Even when Herbert was in there, the Chargers were three and out. You mentioned all the three and outs. They were three and out on four of their first seven possessions. Make them one dimensional. That's the key. Here's the thing, though, where the Chargers emulate or trying to emulate the Ravens. Even if you get them down two possessions, they will not bail out on the run. The Ravens never do. The Titans didn't in the old days. Now, I don't know what they're doing now. I don't know what the (laughs) Titans are doing. But the Chargers will not give up on the run. Uh, and 56% of all runs uh, are their plays or runs. You mentioned the first down. They're fifth and just – they're not going to give up on the run. And even like a third and seven, you have to be ready for them to run the ball. Now, this DBD defense of the Chiefs, demand better defense, also has to deal with multiple tight ends. There's four tight ends on their roster. Go back to what the Chiefs faced in Baltimore and in Cincinnati. Both of those teams went to multiple tight ends, three a lot, four on the roster. They even have the 44 dude that's like going both ways, right? A Matlock guy. Like, uh, but, but the point is, this is going to be a physical fist fight game for the defense. You have, though, to, you must, must, must prevent the big splash run play by Dobbins or even Gus Edwards to be uh, the key in winning this game. And the good news for the Chiefs defense is they've been very good against opposing running backs this year. We talked about that a lot last week because I really thought stopping Bijan Robinson was the whole key against the Falcons. Well, it's the same thing against the Chargers. Got to stop J.K. Dobbins. Against Bijan, the Chiefs did that. They held them to only 1.9 yards per carry. That was his second lowest output in a game where he had double-digit carries in his young career. They were great against Bijan Robinson last week. They were really good against Derrick Henry in week one and very good against Zach Moss in week two. They have stopped the run. The rushing numbers overall are a bit convoluted because we faced Lamar Jackson in week one, and Lamar scrambled like a thousand times and was running all over the place. That's going to distort the numbers a little bit. But against traditional runs and running backs, the defense has been very good, but you cannot let up now. And even though the Chargers are likely going to be without several significant players in this game because of injury or whatever reason, they want to make it a fight in the mud. They want a tough grinded out kind of game and the Chiefs will need to be ready for that no matter who is lining up on offense or defense for the Chargers they could be missing both of their offensive tackles in this game the Chargers so how do they compensate for that multiple tight ends run the ball it's a little bit of play action with those tight ends but here we go another challenge but you know we both have faith as do the kingdom in so now you got to deal with J.K. Dobbins running the ball the Jim Harbaugh hey we're going to bring the Ravens to the AFC West and also dealing with Radio Rick and the artificial sound, all part of the DVD going to Chargerland.